Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to introduce you to the men who make that music at Orchestra Hall. You'll also get to hear an informal and easy-to-understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities. And what's more, you, listening right now, have an opportunity to win two main floor tickets to a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And now let's open your symphony scrapbook to the page devoted to the king of instruments, the violin. And we have with us to discuss and demonstrate this important instrument, Mr. Yasha Herzog, member of the violin section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Herzog, I'm sure our listeners would appreciate your identifying the passage you played at the beginning of this program and perhaps playing some more from that symphonic composition. Well, Mr. Carver, that was for last moment, uh, Brahms' first symphony. I think since this is the uh, first opportunity we've had of uh, having you on the program, and uh, because you just joined the orchestra last uh, fall, it might be interesting to our listeners to uh, have you tell something about your background, your musical training, uh, how you came to study the violin, where you've played before coming to join the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and other interesting facts in your experience. Yeah. Well, I was six years old. And when I got uh, my first uh, lesson, and uh, my first teacher was a bass player, because uh, in my hometown they didn't have actually any experience violin teacher. And at the same time he was a tailor, besides being a bass player and playing in the uh, what they call in Europe this uh, coffee shop, coffee restaurants, and uh, later on he decided that he can't teach me anymore. He says, well, I don't know any more, anything <laughs> what to teach you. So the, finally, my parents found a teacher who originally was a violinist himself, so I started to take lessons from him. And uh, that uh, time I joined the music school in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. And uh, after I finished that school, I the parents sent me to Prague. And at the same time, uh, I had to join the university because at that time my parents considered a mu being a musician as being a gypsy. <laughs> uh, so I started to study chemistry beside uh, violin Professor Feld. Uh, after three years, I was uh, graduated from uh, Prague uh, State Con Conservatory. How did you make out in your chemistry in the meanwhile? Well, I was so much uh, busy with music, so I wrote a letter to my father. I said, either music or I'll never come home. So, of course, it was a little bit like a blackmail, <laughs> but it was the only way to to insist uh, to, to be a musician. And after that, I went to Germany, to Berlin, uh, and... Uh, what they call Hochschule für Musik, uh, High School for Music, and uh, uh, studied with Professor Carl Flash. Well, he's one of the great teachers of all time. Well, uh, he's considered one of the great teachers, and uh, I learned lots from him. And of course, I couldn't finish uh, Hochschule für Musik uh, because uh, the time that was 1933, Hitler came to power and. Uh, he has to leave the, uh, his position, and so naturally I didn't care to study with anybody else. Well, so there are several uh, very famous musicians who left at the same time. That's right. That uh, was uh, Feuermann, cellist. Then uh, Leonid Kreitzer was a pianist. Uh, Paul Hindemith, which is not a, a... He didn't have to, to leave the... The school, but uh, since uh, his wife was a different religion, so he left uh, the same time. 
And from uh, Berlin, I went back uh, home, and uh, I got a position as a concertmaster of Royal Philharmonic in Belgrade, which is my hometown. And at the same time, I was teaching there. And uh, then I had to join the army. Of course, this was a peace time. Then they needed more musicians than fighters. <laughs> so, did you get into the army band or the army orchestra? Well, the army had a sort of like a symphony orchestra, and we used to play for a royal family and uh, foreign delegates and all important people from the whole world. So then, pretty soon, we well, we had been pretty close to the war. It was the Munich Pact and. I said, well, myself, I, being a musician is easier to to move than any other profession. So I went to England, and uh, it was good for me because my my teacher was there, Professor Carl Flesch, and he helped me a lot to start there. Then uh, I left England in 1941 for the United States. And after two weeks, I got an engagement from Mr. Hans Schwieger, who was at that time a conductor in Columbia, South Carolina. And, uh, of course, the season was only six weeks. <laughs> and uh, when we finished the season, I went back to New York, and uh, then I joined the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. I, I wanted to see the country very badly. And I really, I saw it. 26,000 miles, practically in every state. Perhaps your parents were right when they thought that being a musician would make a gypsy out of you. Well, I'm afraid. You see, my father died in 1934, uh, and my mother was killed by the uh, Germans. So I can't write to them. Mm -hmm. well, you, uh, you play, you've played in several other orchestras, haven't yeah. you, in this country? Yeah, I played... Uh, mm -hmm. I was a houseman of CBS Broadcasting System in uh, New York. And then I was uh, again engaged by Mr. Hans Schwieger in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And then uh, on my last engagement, Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Well, we're, we're certainly uh, glad that after all your wanderings, you uh, uh, came with us. Uh, now I think we, uh, we ought to have uh, here a little more um, playing. I know you mentioned... Uh, and to me once that Brahms was your favorite composer. That's correct. And so I imagine it'd be natural that you turn for another selection to uh, the literature of Brahms. I'll, I'll uh, continue there. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question about the uh, instrument you're playing. Is that a very old instrument? Well, it's uh, around 270 years old and made by Gioffredo Kappa. He studied uh, with uh, Nicholas Amati, and uh, later on, when he was an advanced student, he used to even make uh, violins for Amati himself. And Amati was so proud of him that he put his own label as a Amati. And uh, later on, uh, the dealers like uh, Hill and Herman in New York and Hill in London realized that Kappa is a great name and it shouldn't be a shame to put his, to be his own name in the film. So they're, today they're actually selling uh, those films as Kappa, not anymore as Amati. 
In other words, um, uh, is it easy to tell the difference? Uh, uh, between, between Amati and you know, Trap? Of course it is. I mean, the Amati is a uh, is, uh, violin, was more expensive, first of all, and then in the sound, it uh, uh, has a more uh, softness and has more beauty. But, uh, of course, uh, Amati used to sell his fiddles as a, uh, I would say, as a second-rate Amati, not as a first-class Amati, but still as Amati. And uh, mostly uh, uh, women, uh, they use Amati because it's a sort of smaller size than uh, Guarneris or Stradivarius. If a, a violinist with um, a fair amount of experience in, in playing were, say, given a violin while he was uh, blindfolded, and uh, a bow, would he be able to uh, tell the difference between, say, an old and a mati, or an instrument such as yours, and a new instrument? Well, I'm sure between a new instrument and old, he'll be able to <coughs> say the difference. But uh, between a mati and my violin, it would be probably hard. It, of course, depends uh, depends on the, who is playing. If somebody is a beautiful tone, he might fool uh, even the, the a lot of people mm -hmm. as a, a, experts. I mean. In other words, the the player himself has um, uh, considerable influence even on the uh, on the tone of even a a famous instrument. Oh, sure, certainly. So a poor player could take, uh, say, a hype at Strad and uh, <laughs> the violin doesn't play itself. <laughs> you have to to make something out of it. <laughs> well, thanks ever so much, Mr. Herzog, for this uh, interesting talk. Interesting. Uh, a demonstration of a very lovely instrument. Now we're happy to send a pair of tickets for a, a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to Mr. Richard Bass of Chicago for sending in several interesting uh, questions which we'd like to answer at this time. He said a tour such as the Chicago Symphony is undertaking this spring presents several interesting questions which perhaps you might answer on Symphony Scrapbook. Does the orchestra play the same program at all its appearances or do they rehearse different selections for each city? Also, do they take large instruments like double basses and timpani with them on the trip? In answer to the first question, I'd say the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, like every major orchestra, plays the same type of music, no matter what the size of, uh, of the town or city in which they're giving a concert. Uh, we are playing, say, in 14 different cities, and we try not to have too much repetition, uh, because that would be rather boring for both conductor and orchestra if we played the same selections uh, night after night. So we try to play three or four different uh, programs and uh, alter them from time to time so that we have enough variety. Now, as far as taking the large instruments, we take the complete orchestra. In fact, on the tour which we are about to undertake, we'll have a company of about 110 musicians and members of orchestra staff so that we can present a first-class concert in every city in which we are about to play.